I am deeply honored in having been invited by Radio Pakistan to deliver the first lectures in the Iqbal Memorial Series. I shall be speaking on symmetry concepts in modern physics. Iqbal was our greatest poet, our deepest thinker. I take pride in the association of his name with these lectures for two reasons. Firstly, as a true philosopher, Iqbal fully recognized that there is no finality in philosophical thinking and that the progress of all philosophical thought must depend on new discoveries in the field of science. Again and again in his lectures on the reconstruction of religious thought he points towards the possibility of breakthroughs still to come in the field of physics, which may give a new outlook to philosophy. This, indeed, is what has happened since Iqbal's death 27 years ago. And an account of these newer concepts will be the theme of my lectures. Even though Iqbal did not live to see the fulfillment of his own prediction, I'm glad that Radio Pakistan has decided to dedicate these lectures to his memory, which lives forever. My second reason for welcoming Iqbal's association with these lectures is this. I believe that the rise of a great poet or a great writer or a great humanist in any civilization is not an isolated incident, but it's always accompanied by an equally significant emergence of men as great in sciences and philosophy. To give you one example, it's good to recall that at the last zenith of Islamic civilization, in the early part of the 11th century, the Shahnama of Firdosi preceded the encyclopedic Kanun of Ibn Sina and the equally encyclopedic Tanjim of Al-Biruni by no more than 20 years. I am absolutely certain that Iqbal's greatness in poetry and philosophy will not go unmatched so far as the present Muslim renaissance in science is concerned. I believe that now that the nation has begun once again to aspire to higher things, the age of Iqbal, just like the age of Firdosi 800 years ago, will produce in Pakistan its great scientists who will rival the brilliance of Firdosi's contemporaries like Ibn Sina and Al-Biruni. The theme of my lectures is the search for unity in the understanding of nature. I am going to speak of a search which is as old as man's history. From the dawn of all civilization, man has wondered and asked questions. Questions about the color of the sunset, about the brilliance of the stars, about rainfall and cloudburst, about the trajectory of a bullet and a space satellite and eventually about life itself. But in all this questioning there has been one recurring theme. Man has always believed that the answers to these questions, when they come, must follow from just a very few general principles. Man has always held to an unreasoning faith in an eventual unity and an eventual simplicity an eventual symmetry in any basic laws which may govern the universe. The history of science is the history of a search for such unifying concepts. During these lectures I would like to show you how rewarding this faith in the unity, the harmony and the beauty of the basic laws of physics has proved. I shall not be concerned with the processes of life. They fall outside my domain. My subject will mainly be inanimate matter, 
but within this compass. I would like to tell you what we believe today to be the ultimate constituents of all matter and what we think are the basic principles which govern its behavior. Perhaps the first people in the history of mankind who made a systematic search for a unified and irrational explanation of the universe were the Greeks. The Greeks sought the final principles governing nature to lie in four elements of which they believed all matter was made. These, in their view, were the elements of air, water, fire and earth. Greek thought permeated also early Islamic thinking and this classification of elements remained as the basis of medieval science. The real quantitative breakthrough, however, came in the 19th century as the result of thousands of painstaking and accurate laboratory experiments accompanied by some of the deepest analytical thinking. The 19th century chemist could show that in the last analysis all matter in the universe, living or dead, and of whatever form, absolutely everything is made up of just 92 different types of elements, and that every element can be subdivided into tiny units, the so-called atoms. These are the atoms of hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, and so on. The 92nd atom is that of uranium. The science of chemistry is more or less summarized in the so-called periodic table of atoms. This is a chart invented first by the Russian chemist Mendeleev, which orders the atoms in the manner I have described. Hydrogen 1, helium 2, lithium 3, and so on. The 19th century chemist believed that the atoms were indivisible, that they could not be further subdivided. It was found that the atoms attract each other when they are at a little distance apart, that they exhibit a chemical force which is responsible for building from the atoms the complex forms in which matter manifests itself. One also found that the atoms repelled each other when one tried to squeeze them too tightly together. This repulsion meant that the atoms could be pictured as objects with a definite size, like little hard spheres. To get an idea of the atomic sizes, one may remember this. If a cricket ball is magnified to the size of the earth, then each atom in it will look as large as the original ball itself. The discovery that absolutely everything is made up of 92 types of atoms was a tremendous discovery. It made the 19th century scientist absolutely dizzy with excitement. The atoms were the elementary particles. The chemical force was the elementary force. In 1891, Lord Kelvin addressing the British Association for Advancement of Science, went so far as to say, we have discovered in physical sciences all that can be discovered. The rest is more and more refined measurement. This was a bold statement, and like all such bold statements, by a curious accident of history, it was proved false the very same year. In 1891, J.J. Thomson, working in the Cavendish Laboratory at Cambridge, first demonstrated that atoms, after all, were not indivisible, that all atoms could be split into still smaller units. Some 30 years of feverish experimentation followed, led by two of the greatest men of the century, Sir J.J. Thomson and Lord Rutherford. And at the end, there emerged a synthesis still deeper than any the chemist had ever proposed. One could now show that all atoms, all 92 of them, were divisible, that they were made 
of just three fundamental units. These fundamental units were very tiny chunks of matter, each weighing some 10 to the minus 27 grams. These three fundamental units are called the protons, the electrons, and the neutrons. All atoms have a central nucleus made up of two of these three particles. The nucleus is always made of protons and neutrons. Around the central nucleus whirl the electrons, just like planets orbiting around the sun. The atom of hydrogen contains one electron, of helium two electrons, of lithium three electrons, right up to uranium, where the central nucleus is surrounded by 92 electrons. Let me repeat. All atoms consist of a central core, the so-called nucleus. All nuclei contain about equal numbers of protons and neutrons. Surrounding the nuclei are clouds of electrons whirling around at fantastic speeds, speeds in excess of a hundred thousand miles a second. In the heart of every atom, there ever continues a dance of the electrons, more fantastic than human eye has ever seen. The question arose, what is the force that makes the electrons keep orbiting around the central nucleus. This was a new, a mysterious force, the so-called electrical force. Experiments showed that a proton and an electron attract one another when close together. Two electrons, or two protons, however, repel each other. A convenient description for this attraction or repulsion is to ascribe to the electron or the proton an electrical charge. By convention, we say an electron is negatively charged. A proton is, a, is positively charged. We express the facts of repulsion or attraction by postulating a law. Like charges repel. Unlike charges attract. I sometimes marvel at how easily human mind can delude itself and feel complacent that an explanation has been achieved when all that one really has done is to express the same idea in a different manner. It's somehow more comforting to say electrons and protons carry equal and opposite electrical charges. One feels one has gone deeper into the hearts of things, that more has been said than just the bold statement that two electrons repel and an electron and a proton attract each other with a certain mysterious force. Perhaps this capacity to delude ourselves, to feel happy with words, to feel comforted, is a necessary price one must pay for the great gift of language which God has given us. But to return to the electrical force, this then was the primeval force which keeps an atom together. And later one was to discover that the force I spoke of earlier, the chemical force, the force which makes atoms stack together into molecules and stacks molecules to form crystals and living cells, was itself nothing but a manifestation of the basic electrical forces of attraction and repulsion. The deeper that one went, the more it became clear that the electrical force was the key to the understanding of the structure of all matter. For example, one could now understand why metals differ from semiconducting transistors. Some metals, copper and silver for example, have the property that electrons in their atoms are somewhat loosely bound. These electrons can drift freely and course around through the crystal lattice which constitutes a copper or a silver wire. The electrons in a transistor are not so loosely bound. They cannot flow through the length of a transistor crystal as easily. The transistor is thus only a semiconductor. To take another example, in biology, one understood 
that our bodies resemble a modern electrified city. In a human body, just as in a modern city, there's a network of nerve fibers connected centrally to the brain. It's the electrical impulses which the brain sends out that control physiology. For example, a muscle contracts when an electrical impulse shoots out charged molecules, the so-called ions of acetylcholine at its ends. Physiology then, biology, chemistry, all these sciences in principle could be understood in terms of the electrons and the protons and the one fundamental electrical force between them. No wonder then that in 1928 the great physicist Dirac, the successor of Newton in the Lucasian chair of mathematics at Cambridge, could exclaim with justifiable elan, with protons and electrons we can explain the whole of chemistry and most of physics. Dirac was obviously right about chemistry, but was he also right about most of physics? It seemed likely that he was, for earlier in the 19th century, Faraday and Maxwell had made another very remarkable discovery. An electron or a proton, when accelerated, when oscillating, emit electrical waves. Just as a stick moving up and down in a pool of water sets up ripples, water waves in a pool. Similarly, an oscillating electrical charge sets up electromagnetic waves in space. And Maxwell and Faraday discovered that these waves could be picked up by other electrons in a receiving set. Just as the waves in a water pool set up by the moving stick would make a cork floating in the pool bob up and down in rhythmical movement with the moving stick. An example of the waves Maxwell and Faraday spoke about are the radio waves on which my voice is being carried out to you. The electrons in the cathode ray tubes or the transistors of your sets are moving in harmony with the electrons in the transmitter. If we shorten the wavelength of the electrical waves, that is to say, we move the electrons or the protons somewhat faster, we get what is called infrared radiation. The human frame, as we all know, is not attuned to receive the radio waves, but we, or rather our skins, are excellent receivers for the shorter infrared radiation. We call this the heat waves. The sun is continuously beaming out infrared radiation. We receive this radiation in exactly the same manner as a radio set receives the radio signals. There's absolutely no difference whatsoever. Our skins may be likened to the transistors in your sets. Still shorter electrical waves can be received by the nerve cells of the retina of our eyes. These waves are called light radiation, ordinary visible light. Still shorter waves are x-rays to which our retina are not sensitive. Still shorter waves are called gamma rays. The crucial point is that all phenomena of radio waves, of heat, of light, of x-rays, are basically identical. All these are electrical radiations produced when electrons or protons in the transmitter oscillate. 
the waves are received by other electrons and other protons in the receiver's radio tubes, in its transistors, in the retinal membranes of our eyes, in the sensitive nerve cells of the human skin, or the electrons and protons contained in the silver atoms of a sensitive photographic plate. God said, let there be light, to make light and to perceive it. He made protons and electrons, the two charged fundamental particles of physics. In the first lecture of this series, I gave you the picture of the physical sciences which obtained in 1930. In 1930, with just three fundamental particles, electrons, protons and neutrons, and with just one type of force, the electrical force, one seems to have synthesized most science. There were, however, yawning gaps in our knowledge. I said earlier that the nuclear core of every atom contains about equal numbers of protons and neutrons. A neutron is a chunk of matter as heavy as a proton but with no electrical charge and therefore no electrical attraction or repulsion. The question arose, what is the neutron's role in the scheme of things? What holds a nucleus together? Since 1930, physics, and since 1945, unfortunately, the rest of humanity, have been occupied with the nuclear problem. The world of the nucleus revealed a new, a completely unexpected richness, a richness in concept and in fact. Since 1930, one has discovered that, all, that although all known stable atoms we had encountered in nature consisted of just the three fundamental particles I have mentioned before, there do exist other companion particles, companions to the protons, to the neutrons, and to the electrons, as fundamental, as elementary, as these three. It's the story of these newer entities and the domain of phenomena that they have revealed which will be my major concern from now on. I have called these new, newer particles companion particles. It's important to realize that the new objects were not discovered by the classical procedure of subdivision of protons, neutrons, or electrons. The principle of divisibility, which took us from ordinary bulk matter to atoms and then from atoms to protons, no longer functions anymore. With electrons, protons, and neutrons, and the newer particles, one seems to have reached the limits of divisibility. This is something completely new in human experience. If I take an analogy of these particles to a brick thrown against a wall, it's not that the brick fragments into still smaller pieces. For the first time it appears as if we are receiving back five or six whole bricks, identically alike to the first that was thrown one has definitely reached the end of the line of divisibility. One is at a level of comprehension quite different from any that has ever gone before. But before I describe these particles, their interactions, their interrelations, and the concepts associated with them, I would like to spend some time, in fact the whole of today's lecture, to review some of the basic concepts of modern physics, concepts to which I shall be referring again and again 
during these lectures. Unfortunately, these concepts are not easy and I shall need all your patience before I hope that they become a little clearer. The first concepts I shall need are the classical ones of energy and momentum. Momentum is the amount of motion possessed by a body when it's moving. In mathematical language, it's simply the product of the velocity and the mass of the body. Similar to the concept of momentum is another concept, the concept of spin. If an object is rotating around an axis, a spinning cricket ball, for example, we say it possesses spin or angular momentum. The faster an object rotates, the larger is the angular momentum carried by it. Now there's a very important law of classical physics which states that the amount of momentum or spin of a body tends to remain constant unless there are external forces tending to stop the motion or the spin. A spinning flywheel will go on spinning forever if there is no friction of its bearings. A bullet fired from a gun or an arrow shot into space will go on moving forever in a straight line if there is no air friction to stop their motion. Perhaps this great law of classical physics is completely obvious to you in the present satellite age. But it certainly was not obvious to Aristotle nor to Ibn Sina. For it seems quite contrary to the common experience of mankind. If we roll a ball on a table, one's common experience is that sooner or later it comes to a standstill, one might assume. And this is in fact what Aristotle did, that the natural tendency of a moving object is to stop, that things need some force to keep them moving. It took the genius of Galileo and Newton to contradict Aristotle. They asserted that a moving object has the natural tendency to persist in its motion. One should not look for an agency which keeps it moving. One should rather look for an agency which is likely to stop it. This was a tremendous revolution in human thought. It was this bold assertion of Galileo and Newton, which was the beginning of the science of mechanics. This intrinsic persistence Persistence to go on moving or spinning is called inertia. Just plain laziness, if you like, of things to go on doing what they have been doing. Technically, we call these laws the laws of conservation of momentum and conservation of angular momentum. Now the conservation laws have been tested millions of times under controlled conditions. When I say controlled conditions, all I mean is that one has attempted to eliminate extraneous forces like friction very scrupulously. These laws represent an ultimate truth, the distillation of our physical experience. But is there something deep that we can infer from these? Or do we have to accept these as obstinate facts which must be incorporated in any description we make of nature? Now it happens that for the conservation laws of momentum and angular momentum, one can find a correlation of these to something deeper, something more profound, something much more basic. By a process of mathematical reasoning, which I shall not go into, Dirac, whom I mentioned in my first lecture, and the great Hungarian physicist Wigner were able to show 
that this tendency to persist in motion in a straight line, this conservation of momentum, can actually be inferred as a basic law of nature, provided we assume that the results of a physical experiment are independent of where in space the experiment is performed. Not many of us, I do not think, have ever stopped to ask ourselves the question, do a proton and an electron on the planet Mars attract each other with the same force as they do on Earth? Once the question is formulated, I'm sure most of us would instinctively say, yes, of course. Why should the force not be the same? It would be an intolerable complication in the scheme of nature if the laws of physics depended on one's location in the universe. But what's the proof of this assertion? Dirac and Wigner stated that the proof lies in the conservation of momentum. If we can verify the property of persistence of motion in a straight line, we can be sure that the basic laws of physics are the same all over the universe. Personally, I have lived with this reasoning of Wigner and Dirac, a reasoning which connects things so distinct, so disparate, a reasoning which connects the symmetry of the overall universe with a conservation law in the laboratory, a reasoning at once so abstract and yet so concrete. I have lived with it for about 16 years, but I still find it, I still marvel at its boldness, at its audacity and its sweep. It's certainly one of the most powerful things that I know of. So much for classical physics and the symmetries of the overall universe which it seems to reveal. And remember, it's these symmetries which I am after. Now the second discipline which I shall make frequent reference to is Einstein's theory of relativity. There are few subjects in physics which have aroused such strong misconceptions. And the reason for this is not difficult to find. Relativity theory makes statements about time strictly within a context used by the physicist. Unfortunately, the word time is also used by the professional philosopher with a very different connotation the misconceptions arose when the philosopher started to interpret Einstein's work in his own way, sometimes even asserting that if one reflected long enough, the theory was completely obvious a priori. Let me state it categorically. There is nothing a priori about relativity. Relativity is based on a remarkable, on a far-reaching, on an astonishing experiment whose result would never have been conjectured before the experiment was performed. The experiment is the following. If we take a lamp and measure the velocity of light which it emits, you get a certain value. More precisely, you discover that the velocity in vacuum is 100 and 86,000 miles per second. Now move the lamp as fast as you possibly can. Naively one might imagine that the light velocity will differ depending on whether the lamp is moving or not. When the experiment was actually performed towards the end of the last century by Michelson and Morley, they found that there was no difference whatsoever. The velocity of light is exactly the same whether the source of light moves or not. Not only that, 
the velocity also remains in unchained, irrespective of what the observer may be doing. One may start running away from the light source with a speed even as fast as that of light itself. Any normal sane person would expect that if one is running away with that speed, that light will never catch up with the observer. But astonishingly enough, one would be wrong again. The velocity of light will remain the same as before. As I said before, this is astounding. This is unexpected. There is nothing a priori about it. But these were the facts and they just had to be incorporated into physics. Einstein's profound analysis did just that. Einstein expressed the results of his analysis in some spectacular language. He stated that the resolution of the paradox lay in the relative character of time. And when he used the word time, it was in the sense of certain mathematical equations. I shall not try to go deeper into this mathematical aspect. For my purposes, the crucial content of relativity is just the following. From the constancy of light velocity, Einstein deduced that matter and energy must be identical. To illustrate, Einstein asserted that a lamp shade, for example, which is absorbing the energy of light radiation, must get heavier. The absorbed light manifesting itself as an increase in the matter content, in the inertia of the lamp shade. The radio transmitters of Radio Pakistan pouring electrical energy into space are progressively diminishing in their matter content. Luckily, these transmitters are also being replenished. They are receiving energy from the electrical mains. But one might really worry about the sun, for the sun is certainly getting progressively lighter because it's pouring out heat and light energy. The sun is losing weight. These statements can be and have been verified hundreds of times in the laboratories. So much for relativity theory. The third set of concepts I shall have occasion to refer to are the concepts of quantum theory. Quantum theory, like relativity, began in the early part of the century with certain experiments whose results one would never have credited so obstinately contrary are they to anything one had apprehended before. Quantum theory asserts that there are in nature certain fundamental units and that a number of physical quantities can exist only as integer multiples of these basic units. One simple example is the quantization of electric charge. A proton is some 2,000 times as heavy as an electron, but both carry the same quantity of electric charge. All charges in nature exist as integer multiples of this one fundamental unit. Take another example. I have spoken before of spin, of angular momentum. Recall that this is the amount of rotation possessed by a given object. One would never have believed that one cannot impart an arbitrary amount of spin, for example, to a cricket ball. Yet this is precisely what quantum theory asserts. It's impossible to find in nature a spinning object, a top, a cricket ball, whose spin will not be a half integer multiple of, the, of a basic unit discovered by Planck. One may encounter spin values half of Planck's unit 
or one Planck unit or two Planck units, but never 1.3 or 2.7 or 2.67 times the Planck basic value. Somehow, for quantum theory, integers or at worst half integer multiples of a basic unit are sacred, are inviolate. And as I said before, if the theory did not have the sanction of precise experiment, one would never have believed it. To take one more example, would anyone believe that the energy carried by the radio waves or a light ray or a heat radiation can exist only in integer multiples of a certain basic unit? in discrete, countable chunks that energy is quantized. Again, if we did not know that this was true by repeated experimentation, one would hardly believe it. In the case of electrical radiation, one has designated this basic unit of energy as a photon. And I would like you to remember the word photon. A beam of light or a beam of x-rays in this quantum view then consists of nothing but a stream of photons, all photons traveling with the velocity of light. Let me now recapitulate. On the basis of what we know, we believe that the universe, the space-time we live in, is endowed with certain symmetry properties, with certain characteristics. We understand the origin of some of these characteristics. Others we are forced to accept at present as empirical facts and leave perhaps for our successors in the 21st or the 22nd centuries to find the deeper basis of. We know empirically that there are certain conservation laws, laws which assert that certain properties persist. We believe we can find a deeper significance for these laws in the sense that we can correlate them with the properties of space and time. From conservation of momentum one may infer that space is location symmetric. From conservation of energy we may infer that the results of an experiment do not differ with the epochs of time at which the experiment is performed. That the electron and the proton will attract each other with the same force today as they did yesterday and will tomorrow. From relativity experiments, we know that the velocity of light has astonishing properties, that it's an invariant, that it's unchanging, irrespective of the motion of the light source or the movement of the observer. We accept this as something which we must incorporate in our fundamental description of nature. Once we do this, we can make the inference that all energy possesses inertia, and vice versa. Then again, experiment has forced us to accept quantum theory. We know that we can never impart spin to an object which is not an integer or, to, or at worst a half integer multiple of a basic unit given by Planck. We know that the energy of electromagnetic radiation can exist only in discrete quantum units the so-called photons. We find this utterly astonishing. We do not know why some physical quantities should be quantized. Perhaps this is connected with the topological structure of space and time, but we do not know. This again is a problem for the fortunate few of a hundred years after. All we can do at present is to incorporate these facts 
within the formalism that we use. And this we have learned to do. Let me begin today by reminding you of the ground we have covered in the first two lectures. By 1930, the physicist believed that all matter in the universe was composed of three particles, electrons, protons, and neutrons. He also believed that all energy, whether it existed as heat or light or chemical force, is basically electrical in character and manifests itself in discrete chunks, in discrete quanta. These quanta were called photons by Planck and Einstein. All matter and all energy in this view was then composed of just four fundamental entities, photons, electrons, protons and neutrons. The electrons and protons carry an electrical charge. When accelerating, these particles emit heat or light in the form of photons. The neutron, however, is electrically neutral. Now these four particles are not just simple chunks of matter or energy. One other property they all seem to possess is that of intrinsic spin. An electron or a proton continually spins like a top around an axis fixed in the body. And as I said in the second lecture, the spin motion, like all spin motions in the universe, is a half integer multiple of the fundamental unit of Planck. Now why should elementary particles behave like spinning tops? What gives them their intrinsic spin? Why should the spin values be just what they are? The answer to this last question was brilliantly given in 1928 by Dirac at Cambridge in a paper which is an epic of modern physics. In the second lecture, I spoke of the laws of persistence, of persistence of inertia, of persistence of the spin motion. You may remember, I said one could show that this quality of persistence, persistence in spinning, for example, was related to a symmetry of the universe, to a symmetry in respect of rotations. Dirac was able to show that one, that when one marries together this notion of rotation symmetry of the universe with the ideas of Einstein's relativity theory, one can show that the electrons or the protons or the neutrons must indeed spin and with the precise values which had been found by the experiment. As I said earlier, Dirac's work is one of the most momentous in modern physical theory. I hope you will bear with me for thus rhapsodizing about it without giving you the successive stages of his reasoning. It's impossible in a lecture of this type to convey the depth or the beauty of Dirac's work. Not only did he give a deeper meaning to the concept of intrinsic spin, Dirac was also able to deduce from the same equation something even more important. Dirac could show on general grounds that all particles in nature must exist in pairs, that to every particle there must correspond an antiparticle of precisely the same mass the same spin, but opposite charge. Thus the existence of the negatively charged electron must imply the possible existence of an anti-electron carrying a positive electric charge. 
if the hydrogen atom exists there can equally well exist atoms of anti-hydrogen perhaps in some distant corner of the universe I have said in some distant corner of the universe advisedly for Dirac could show that if a particle and an antiparticle collide both of them must disappear their energy their momentum their spin going into photons in Dirac's language antimatter is minus matter negative matter matter and antimatter just cannot coexist in the same part of the universe without the ever impending catastrophe of annihilation I must say however that some astronomers do believe that just this type of annihilation is taking place at certain sites in space far away from us where one can locate powerful X-ray sources in the heavens. Dirac made his prediction regarding the existence of antimatter in 1934. The anti-electron was discovered in cosmic rays the same year. The discovery of the anti-proton and the anti-neutron had to wait longer till the completion of the giant proton synchrotron, the proton accelerating machine in Berkeley, California in the 1950s. At one stroke Dirac had doubled the number of elementary particles from four to the number eight. There is an apocryphal story in Cambridge of how Dirac first conceived of the idea of anti or minus matter. As a graduate student, Dirac once attended a problems drive organized by the Cambridge Undergraduate Mathematical Society, the so-called Archimedeans. One of the problems presented to Dirac was the following. On a stormy night, three fishermen go fishing and make a big haul of fish. But the storm forces them to seek refuge on a lonely island where they tie up their boats and go to sleep. During the night, one of the fishermen gets up. He would like to get away. Without waking up his friends, he decides to divide the catch into three equal parts. He does this, but he finds that one fish is outstanding. This fish he throws into the sea, takes away his one-third, and goes away. A short while later, the second fisherman wakes up. He does not know that one of his friends has departed. He also proceeds to divide the hall into three equal parts. He also finds one fish outstanding. He throws it into the sea and rows away with one with his one third portion. The same thing happens a third time. The problem is what is the minimum number of fish which can be subdivided in this manner three times successively with one fish outstanding each time. The story goes on that Dirac, when presented with this problem, thought for a few seconds and then jotted down his answer. Minus two fish. You see, if you divide minus two fish into three equal heaps, each heap will consist of minus one fish with plus one fish outstanding. Minus three plus one equals minus two. Now throw the outstanding plus one fish into the sea. Take your minus one fish away. Since minus one and plus one equals zero, you've really taken nothing out of the heap. You are leaving behind exactly minus two fish in the heap, which are ready for exactly the same subdivision by the second fisherman as before. At that time, 
Dirac did not worry what minus fish may signify. Nor does the story relate if he got that prize that night. But when faced with the minus electrons two years later, as a consequence of his relativistic equation, Dirac just had to find a meaning for these minus particles. And he came up with the brilliant notion that these signified antiparticles uncovering at the same time one more profound symmetry in the universe, the symmetry of matter and antimatter. Now before we go any further, let me reca recapitulate once again the position that we have reached. In the 1930s, the view of nature was that all matter and all energy could be considered to be made up of four elementary particles or of their antiparticles. Every particle possesses a specified magnitude of spin. It looks like a spinning top. In addition to the spin motion, electrons and protons carry an electrical charge, while the neutron is electrically neutral. Immediately after the discovery of the neutron, the question arose if this particle is indeed electrically neutral. It can possess no electrical force of attraction or repulsion relative to protons or electrons. We had earlier learned in the first lecture that neutrons and protons together make up the central core, the central nucleus of all atoms. What then is the force which keeps the nucleus bound together? Why do the protons and the neutrons inside a nucleus not fly apart? The dilemma appears deeper still when one reflects that a nucleus is incomparably more compact, more tightly bound than any atom that we know of. To compare sizes, if a hydrogen atom is blown over to the size of the city of Karachi, the hydrogen nucleus would be no more than the size of the Kaede Azam's mausoleum. This compactness, this tight binding, must come from some force inside the nucleus. We may call such a force the nuclear force. And this force must be at least a hundred to a thousand times stronger than the electrical force which keeps an atom together. The neutron, though electrically neutral, must carry a nuclear charge. And so indeed must the proton, since a nucleus contains protons also. The tremendous strength of the nuclear force compared to the electrical force would explain why a nuclear bomb, size for size, must be thousands of times more potent than a chemical bomb. The strength must explain why nuclear fuel in a nuclear reactor must deliver a thousand times more power. With the knowledge of the nuclear force, of its immense strength, and with the knowledge of nuclear reactions, one knew that at long last one had found the reason which made the stars shine, and how the sun can pour out such vast amounts of energy without being depleted. I always fondly recall the story of Professor Bete, the night that he first realized that the tremendous outpouring of luminous energy from the stars was basically the energy of nuclear reactions continually taking place in the stars' interior. Bete and his wife were standing gazing on the desert sky. 
when Mrs. Betty said, How beautiful do the stars shine tonight? Betty turned slowly to her and said, Would you believe it? But right now you are next to the only person in the universe who knows what does make them shine at all. I have spoken of the nuclear force qualitatively so far. Since 1935, the major problem in physics has been to find its quantitative aspects. And I shall devote the remainder of this and the next lecture to these quantitative aspects. One has had a quantitative description of the electrical force since the times of Maxwell and Faraday in the 19th century. One had known from the works of Einstein and Planck that photons, the particles of heat and light and x-radiation, are the quanta of electrical energy. The first question which one asked for nuclear energy was, what are its quanta? Yukawa, in 1935, was one of the first persons to ponder on this problem. And his reasoning went something like this. As I have said earlier many times, an electron and a pro or a proton, when accelerated, emit or absorb photons. One can understand the attractive electrical force between a proton and an electron in terms of an exchange of photons. Think of two rugger players who make passes to each other. One throws the ball over, the other one catches it, throws it back again and so on. This exchange of the rugger ball is impossible to carry out unless the players remain within a specified distance of each other. A spectator who from a distance cannot see the ball and its exchange may however notice that these two men always remain close to each other. If the spectator is a physicist, he will call this an attractive force between the two players. Just take over the analogy of these two players to the physics of elementary particles, to an electron and a proton. The electrons and the protons are the players. The quantum of the photon is their rugger ball. The proton emits the photon. The electron absorbs it, re-emits it a short while later, passing it back to the proton. And this continual exchange is what we believe is responsible for the proton and the electron remaining close to each other, for the attractive force between them. Yukawa asked himself the question, what is the rugger ball exchanged continually between a proton and a neutron? And his answer was, there have to be three rugger balls. They must be positively, negatively, and neutral charge. These rugger balls must have one-seventh of the mass of a proton or a neutron. He called these particles, these quanta, mesons. Mesons because they had masses intermediate between the proton and the electron. Yukawa made these predictions in 1935. The war intervened. But the search for Yukawa's particles went on, 
and in 1949, Powell at Bristol was actually able to identify just the particles predicted by Yukawa. The quanta of the nuclear force had been found. Yukawa always tells the story that he kept a notebook handy near his bed every night. And during the sleeping and waking hours during the night, he would jot down the thoughts which came to him. And every morning he would look eagerly at the notes he had made in the darkness to see if they made sense. Once and only once, did the notes make sense? And this was the beginning of the meson theory of nuclear forces. Yukawa's prediction of the mesons is one of the most fascinating stories in the interplay of pure thinking with experiment in our subject. And I shall continue this story and the discovery of companion particles to those which Yukawa had predicted in the next lecture. For tonight's lecture, I wish to return to the theme of symmetries and in particular the symmetries of the nuclear force. You may remember we ended the last lecture with a description of the two nuclear particles, protons and neutrons, each one of which carries a nuclear charge. Before closing, I also spoke of Yukawa's prediction that if the nuclear force exists between protons and neutrons, there must also exist three particles, three carriers of this force, the so-called mesons. And I ended the last lecture by speaking of the triumphant confirmation of Yukawa's speculation with the discovery of just these three particles which Yukawa had predicted. This was 1947. With the discovery of the three mesons, the number of elementary particles had arisen to a total of seven. One felt somehow that enough was enough. One felt that one had all the ingredients to make a complete theory of the two basic forces of nature, the electrical force as well as the nuclear force. Unfortunately, when, when one actually tried to consider the theories quantitatively, even though one succeeded with the electrical force, one met with miserable for failure in the case of the nuclear force. And this, in spite of the fact that in the meanwhile the physicist had learned to unlock the force itself in all manner of nuclear devices. Clearly something was missing. Clearly the total of seven elementary particles was not enough to explain all the mysteries of the universe. But from 1947 onwards, this something missing started to come in. First, in a small measure, among the cosmic ray showers, and then, literally in torrents, from the newly constructed proton synchrotrons at Brookhaven, Berkeley, Dubna, and Geneva. Between 1947 and 1962, 
something like 30 new particles were discovered, each seemingly as elementary, each seemingly as fundamental as the proton and the meson. It's my purpose tonight to speak of the theoretical concepts which one had to develop to understand these newer particles, their correlations, their interactions, perhaps the very reasons for their existence. I must warn you, however, right away, the ideas and the concepts are not easy. And also, they are in a stage of development and flux. And further, I have no blackboard on which to draw and illustrate. It may help if you could perhaps keep a piece of paper and a pencil handy and jot down some of the numbers. Briefly, what the experiments showed was the following. As I said earlier, the nuclear particles, the protons and neutrons, are spin-half objects. Between 1947 and 1954, one discovered a total of six new spin one-half particles, all closely resembling protons and neutrons. There was in nature then a multiplet of eight nuclear objects, all with spin one-half, all as basic to the nuclear force problem as the familiar protons and neutrons. Likewise, the number of Yukawa mesons increased, once again from three to eight. In Yukawa's language, there were not only three carriers of the nuclear force, but a total of eight. And as if this was not bad enough, in addition to these two families of mesons and nucleons, two other families of particles were discovered, each consisting of nine entities. This flood of new particles, 34 in all, was bewildering. But even more bewildering was an account of their mutual interactions. As a rule, all nuclear particles can emit or absorb mesons, but the question was, which ones? What was the basic law governing the behavior of the newer objects? The situation was confused for a number of years, but around 1960 a definite pattern began to emerge, and the pattern could be summarized as follows. What I called the nuclear charge consists really, one discovered, of two distinct varieties. These varieties have been called the isotopic charge and the hypercharge. The names of these charges are not important. All that is important to remember is that nuclear charge is really of two varieties. When one discovered a multiplet of eight particles, some members of the multiplet carry a hypercharge, others carry an isotopic charge, some others carry both types of charges. The type of meson a nuclear particle can emit or absorb depends on the type of charge it carries. Together with the electric charge, the two nuclear charges make a totality of three. One could then classify all the newly discovered particles in terms of these three charges. Let me summarize at this stage once again. A new era opened up in physics during the years 1947 to 1960. As a result of feverish experimentation with the giant accelerators, a new and perhaps embarrassing richness was discovered 
among the sets of nuclear particles and among the mesons. As I said earlier, it's not important to remember the names of the particles or their different correlations. All that is necessary to remember is that in early 1964 there was a total of eight particles constituting a nuclear multiplet of spin one half, nine other nuclear particles constituting a multiplet of spin three half, eight Yukawa mesons forming a multiplet of spin zero, and nine mesons of spin one. Notice the recurrence of the magic numbers eight and nine. The particles in a multiplet could be distinguished by giving either their electric charge or their hypercharge or their isotopic charge. These facts which I have summarized took years of patient experimentation, long and lonely vigils among the snows of Jungfraujoch or work with the multi-million accelerators which are highly capricious machines. These results were not arrived in a day. They had to be deduced painstakingly from data which was often inadequate but almost and almost always cluttered with inconsequential secondary details. One of my colleagues, Professor Matthews at Imperial College London, once gave a brilliant description of how hampered the experimental physicist in our subject is. The only tool an experimental worker has is a beam of protons, accelerated by a synchrotron. One directs this beam onto a lump of copper or aluminium. From the number and the variety of particles which fly off at a given angle to the original beam direction, one is required to reconstruct and deduce the spins and the charges and the forces which may exist among the fundamental particles. The analogy which Matthews gave was that of a beautiful marble statue in a darkened room on which one is playing a jet of water from a hose. Supposing one cannot see the statue, all one can do is to scoop out the amounts of water which is splashed from each square inch of the statue. Suppose you were set the task of reconstructing how the statue itself looks, its lines and the figure and the shape, and the only information supplied was this spray of splashing water. I am sure you would begin to sympathize with the difficulties of the modern experimental physicist. Returning to my multiplets of eights and nines, the very first question which arose was this. Here are eight or nine objects, all essentially similar, can we, in some approximation, treat these particles as manifestations of one single entity? Is there some unity in this multiplicity? Is there some single symmetry principle in terms of which one may comprehend the complexity presented by these particles? We had earlier an example of this essential unity. We had an example of this in the particles and antiparticles of Dirac. One can speak of a particle and its antiparticle, a proton and an antiproton, for example, as a two-fold multiplet. But we also know that the two particles in such a multiplet, the particle and antiparticle, are intimately related. The proton is the minus particle of the antiproton. The two are the facets of the same reality, two opposite sides of the same coin. The postulate by Dirac of particle-antiparticle symmetry 
makes it possible conceptually to dispense with the twofold multiplet. One need never speak of the two distinctly. It's the symmetry principle which is of paramount importance. The existence of the twofold multiplet being something which follows as a consequence of the symmetry. Take another example. You may recall when I spoke about spin, I said a spin half particle can exist in two states. It can either spin in a clockwise direction relative to its direction of motion or in an anti-clockwise direction. One can think of spin half protons as two distinct particles, one spinning clockwise, the other spinning anti-clockwise, one behaving like a left screw, the other behaving like a right screw. A completely equivalent description would be to say that there is just one particle, the spinning proton. But additionally, there is a symmetry principle which permits us to infer from the existence of a left spin, the existence also of a right spin. Or take one more example. If you have a Persian carpet or an embroidered bed cover with a pattern on it, one can describe the pattern in many different ways. Take a concrete example of a hexagonal pattern, six flowers arranged on the corners of a hexagon. To someone wishing to weave a similar carpet, I may either give the position of all the six flowers individually or simply describe just one typical flower and then say make a hexagon of similar objects. One can be more explicit, one could say a hexagon is determined by taking the first flower and rotating it through an angle of 60 degrees. The symmetry principle then is the rotation through 60 degrees. The symmetry principle provides the unifying principle for all the six flowers. The pattern itself, if you like, is a manifestation of the symmetry. It's the symmetry which is once again the paramount concept. The problem in nuclear physics then was what is the symmetry principle underlying its three charges and its multiplets of eights and nines? What is the secret of the carpet pattern of the universe itself? Now, about 100 years ago, one of the greatest mathematicians of the world, Sophus Lee, had tabulated all conceivable abstract symmetries. He had classified all symmetries, or symmetry groups as he called them, in terms of a number of key directions. Recall that to make a hexagon, there is just one key direction a 60 degree rotation. Recall that for a particle-antiparticle symmetry there is just one key statement, a key direction, change plus with minus. Recall that for a spin one-half particle there is just one key direction, flip over a left screw with a right screw, a right spin with a left spin. To realize this physically you can look in a mirror. A mirror reflects a left hand to a right hand. The problem which Sophus Lee addressed himself to and solved was the following. Given the number and direction, number and type of the key directions, can one say unambiguously how many particles, how many flowers would constitute the pattern, the multiplet? For the case of the carpet, even a child can work out the answer. Given the key direction, rotate through 60 degrees, one must get six flowers, all lying on the corners of a hexagon. Suppose, however, the key directions are more complicated. Suppose there are, in fact, three directions, three symmetries, like flipping of the electric charge with the hypercharge and of the hypercharge with the isotopic charge. How can one work out the detailed pattern which will emerge as a consequence of this symmetry? 
So firstly, he gave the following method. Consider a triangle, an equilateral triangle, with corners representing the three types of charges. And now attempt to make all conceivable patterns by a juxtaposition of such triangles in a well-specified manner. What are the patterns which one arrives at? One of the first one is a hexagon again, but this time with two extra elements at the center, making a total of eight, of eight corners, of eight elements, of eight particles, if you like. The numbers eight and three are interrelated. From the symmetry of the three charges, from a postulated symmetry of the three charges, one may infer that nuclear particles will exist in multiplets of eight. And this, you may recall, is precisely what one had discovered. Once again, I have to apologize to you for the meagerness of my description. It's indeed galling that one cannot draw even a simple figure to make the idea come alive. I hope I have not made the idea sound trivial. Lee's theory is in fact one of the profoundest, one of the most beautiful mathematical constructs which the human mind has invented. Sophus Lee was the Michelangelo of classical mathematics. Even though I may have failed to convey the depth of his ideas, I do hope the basic notion of the symmetry is clear. Uh, let me repeat once again. In the quest for symmetry of nuclear law, one had found a deep correlation between the number of charges, electric, hyper and isotopic, and the number of elementary particles which a nuclear multiplet can contain. The multiplets themselves are scarcely important after the symmetry is discovered. However, the fact that the eight particles in the multiplet have the same nuclear properties implies that the three charges themselves are similar. They are mutually interchangeable. They can be flipped one with another. That is to say, the three charges themselves are a manifestation if you like, of one single charge. In technical language, a unitary charge. The symmetry itself is known as SU3, U for unitary, and 3 for the three types of charges which we have considered. The unitary symmetry the SU3 symmetry seemed to be succeeding well around early 1964. But all the time there was one serious difficulty. On the basis of SU3, one could understand multiplets consisting of eight particles as I have described to you. But what about the multiplets consisting of nine particles, which had also been found experimentally? In Lee's classification, one can check quite easily that the only possible patterns of spin half or spin three half, which can exist at all, must contain either eight or ten or twenty-seven particles, but never nine. Recall that in early 1964, one knew of only nine nuclear particles of spin three half. If the SU3 ideas were right, there must exist a tenth particle. Otherwise, the whole edifice would collapse. Those of you who may be familiar with the philosophy of Pythagoras may recall the famous emblem which Pythagoreans displayed in their secret meetings. This was a figure made from an equilateral triangle with exactly ten corners. In Lee's language, 
This was one of the allowed SU-3 patterns. In 1964, one knew of nine spin-3 half particles filling all the corners of the Pythagorean figure except the apex. The crucial tent on the apex was missing. The characteristics of this missing object could be predicted almost exactly from the existence of the remaining nine. One could assert that the particle must carry an electric charge of minus one unit, a hypercharge of minus two units, and no isotopic charge. One could predict its mass. It must be nearly twice as heavy as a proton. Its spin must, of course, be three half. The search was on and in February 1964, this elusive object was at last discovered. A team of 32 experimental physicists at the Brookhaven National Laboratory tracked down two of these particles, the so-called omega minuses, among the photographs which they had taken of millions of other particles which were scanned. These precious two omega minuses are in fact just the only two which exist in the whole universe to our knowledge. The discovery completely vindicated the application of the SU3 unitary symmetry. The possibility that such a symmetry might exist was first conjectured by Japanese physicists led by Professor Sakata in 1959. It was elaborated in the present form in 1961 by one of my pupils in London, Y. Neyman, and independently by Professor M. Gelman at the California Institute of Technology. It represented a tremendous step forward, a deep synthesis in nuclear physics in 1964. As I said earlier, the validity of the symmetry was established in February of last year. The same year, however, SU3 was no longer news. A deeper still synthesis came in September 1964 and a still, still deeper one in January 1965. From its somewhat measured and slow growth, the physics of elementary particles acquired a momentum in the last six months which is simply breathtaking. I shall deal with these very, very recent developments in my next lecture. Today will be the last lecture of this series and to conclude it I wish to do two things. First, I wish to tell you, as I promised last time, of the most recent synthesis achieved in respect of the symmetries of the nuclear force. Second, I wish to speak of two other forces of nature, the gravitational force and the so-called weak force. With this, my survey of all known forces of nature will be complete. I shall finally make some remarks about the general outlook in the subject. I ended the last lecture by speaking of the SU3 symmetry scheme as the basic underlying symmetry of the nuclear force. You may recall that the symmetry takes its name from three types of charges, electric, hyper and isotopic. The symmetry lies in treating all these three charges as if they were manifestations of just one single 
unitary entity. It's perhaps good to remind you once again when I use the words manifestations of a single unitary entity I do not wish to load the phrase manifestation or unitary with philosophical or mystical connotations. Let's never forget that mathematics is the language of physics and all words which we use in physics have a precise and a mathematical sense. I also said in my last lecture that using Sophus Lee's ideas one also learned that as a consequence of the SU3 symmetry scheme nucleons and mesons must be found in nature in multiplets of eights or tens or twenty sevens and this seems confirmed by experiment. Now throughout these lectures you may have noticed that elementary particles and elementary phenomena have been characterized by two types of properties. First are the so-called internal properties like electric charge or hypercharge. Second are the external properties like spin. Spin is external because it has deeper roots in the structure of something external to all of us, in the structure of space and time. It had always been a recurring dream in physics that someday one may be able to find a deeper unification between these two types of properties, that internal and external properties might merge together in one single whole. This then would be the ultimate synthesis and it's the story of this synthesis achieved in the last few months that I wish to tell you during the first part of today's lecture. Before I go on to discuss the new symmetry itself let's briefly go over the concepts of spin once again. In terms of Sophus Lee's ideas intrinsic spin symmetry may be called the SU2 symmetry. This is because we have learnt in the fourth lecture a spin one half particle can be pictured as an object rotating either clockwise or anti-clockwise relative to its direction of motion. In terms of multiplets these two left and right spinning objects form a two-fold multiplet. In Lee's language just as three varieties of charge give rise to an SU3 symmetry two varieties of spin give rise to an SU2 symmetry. Just as SU3 multiplets consist of 8, 10 or 27 particles one can show that spin multiplets, the multiplets of SU2 would contain two or three or four different spinning objects. To take a concrete example, in nature we have eight particles of spin one half and ten of spin three half. In making these counts of eights and tens we made no distinction of left spin from right spin. If we do make this distinction, the multiplets really consist of 8 times 2, that is 16 objects, and 10 times 4, that is 40 distinguishable objects, making up a total of 16 plus 40, 56 distinguishable entities. Now, as a first part of the program to synthesize spin with charge, Let's assume that the right and the left spins can be treated on a basis completely analogous to the three types of charges. That is to say, consider a total of six types of charges. Electric charge spinning clockwise, electric charge spinning anticlockwise, hypercharge spinning clockwise, 
hypercharged, spinning anticlockwise, and so on. These six charges will now give rise to a new Lie group. The new Lie structure will be SU6, six corresponding to the six types of charges. Now the mathematics, the group theory of the SU6 structure has its own volition. One can either look up Lie's works or work out oneself diagrammatically the structure of the SU6 multiplets. The first result one discovers to one's astonishment is that the lowest nucleon multiplet of SU6 must contain precisely 56 entities. I said astonishment because 56 is just the number of distinguishable nucleons which I said a moment ago we know of in nature. This 56-fold multiplet of SU6 now contains both the familiar protons and the neutrons as well as the exotic omega minus which I may remind you I said in my second lecture in my fourth lecture there are just two specimens known to us in the whole universe. A still deeper synthesis has been achieved. Spin half and spin three half nucleons are no longer distinct. 56 of them form one single entity. Spin is nothing but a new form of charge. One has married internal symmetries of charge with the external symmetries of spin and space-time. The basic idea of marrying spin with charge was first conjectured essentially 27 years ago by the great Hungarian physicist Wigner. In its present form, the symmetry principle was worked out in September of last year by Professor Feza Gursay, a Turk, by Professor Redicati, an Italian, and by Professor Sakita, a young Japanese physicist. Now the SU6 symmetry scheme was profound, but it was not profound enough. It had one serious flaw. When speaking of space-time and of its synthesis with charge, one must make sure that the space-time concepts one uses accord with the theory of relativity. The situation with spin in 1964 was the same as the one which Dirac faced in 1928. At that time one knew of the spinning electrons, but spin seemed to have no relevance to relativity. Dirac had the audacity to put relativity first. He did not consciously look for the spin of the electron. A synthesis of relativity with quantum theory led him automatically to the concept of electrons spin. What we wanted was a similar miracle to happen for the case of nuclear particles. One would like to merge relativity onto the structure of the three types of charges, electric, hyper and isotopic. One wanted the analog of Dirac's equation for the electron, but this time for the proton. And this was precisely what was achieved in January of this year. Roughly speaking, corresponding to the four dimensions of space and time, one constructs a structure SU4. Combining this with the SU3 symmetry of nuclear physics, one emerges with the natural synthesis of 3 times 4 SU12. This perhaps is then the ultimate symmetry of the nuclear force. The multiplets extend once again from 56 to 364 particles. What is much more important, one is at long last the full dynamics of nuclear physics. And further and still more important, 
it's unlikely that a higher symmetry can be found to displace SU12. This is because unless and un until one discovers that space-time has more than four dimensions, until such time that one discovers more than just three charges, SU12 is the maximal symmetry one could achieve. Perhaps at long last we appear to be coming to the end of the road, to the end of the discovery of the pattern of the carpet. One can perhaps at long last write down a quantitative measure of the nuclear force. In the dream of Yukawa in 1935, the problem which eluded physics for the last 30 years. It will no doubt make you also elated to learn that most of this work was done, or rather a significant part in this work was played by your compatriots, notably at the International Center for Theoretical Physics at Trieste. Some of the names concerned in the development are those of Mirza Baki Beg, Dr. M. A. Rashid, Dr. Fayyazuddin, and others. This concludes what I wanted to say about nuclear force. Let us take stock of the situation once again. We have so far discussed two forces in all these lectures, the electric and the nuclear. These two forces give us a complete comprehension of the world of the atom and also of the world of the nucleus. There are in addition, however, to these two forces, two more forces in nature. One is the ever-present classical force of gravitation, the first universal force to be discovered, the force which holds us all captives to the surface of the earth. Every particle in nature carries what one may call a gravitational charge. The astonishing thing about gravitational charge is that unlike all other charges, there is only one type of gravitational charge. There are no positives or negatives among them. Put it another way, every particle in nature attracts every other particle. There is no gravitational force of repulsion. A second remarkable fact about gravitation is its, is its extreme weakness. Relative to the electrical force, the gravitational force is a billion, billion, billion times weaker. To give you an idea of the orders of magnitude involved, let's make a comparison. The gravitational force, the gravitational pull on the surface of the Earth is the result of all the matter contained within the Earth itself. An ordinary electromagnet used for lifting material about a centimeter or so in length can produce an electromagnetic force as strong as the pull exerted by the whole of the Earth. Size by size, a tiny electrical system is as potent as the pull exerted by the whole sphere, by the whole of matter contained within the Earth's sphere. The question arises, if the gravitational force is so weak, why is it so persistent, why the electrical force is not? We are all made up of electrons and protons. We are electrical systems. But none of us exert electrical forces on anyone else, even though the electrical force is so very much more powerful. The reason is the one I have already mentioned. Electrical charge is of two types, positive and negative, while the gravitational charge is of only one sign. The electrical force cancels itself out. The gravita gravitational force never cancels itself. Another question which arises with the gravitational force is the following. Are there any carriers of the gravitational force? just like the carriers of the electrical and the nuclear forces. To remind you, 
The photon, the quantum of light, is the carrier of electrical force. The meson is the carrier of the nuclear force. Is there an analogous particle, a particle which we may call the graviton? Theoretically, perhaps there should be. Experimentally, unfortunately, we do not know. Because of the tenuous weakness of a gravitational force, it would be extremely hard to detect these carriers if they exist. This is surely one of the things which perhaps the 21st century physicist will know much more about. In addition to gravity, there is one more force of nature, the so-called weak force. It's something very peculiar. Its very existence was unknown until the neutron was discovered in 1930. It's a force which seems to have just one purpose, to make all elementary particles decay. Whereas a free proton or a free electron, left to themselves, live on forever. This is not the case for a free neutron or a free meson. Left to themselves, a free neutron disappears in about 10 minutes. It decays into a proton, an electron, and a new and a rather mysterious object called the neutrino. It is as if the neutron was really a time bomb, its fuse rate being determined by the so-called weak force. The neutrino, the signature of this weak force, is a particle of spin one-half. <coughs> it's electrically neutral. It travels with the velocity of light. And it has one more extraordinary peculiarity. Whereas left spinning neutrinos exist, there are no right spinning neutrinos. The neutrino does not obey the mirror symmetry principle. Like Hoffman in Offenbach's opera, a neutrino reflected in a mirror sees no shadow of itself. Why this is so, we do not know at all. Summarizing once again, we have four types of forces. The strongest is the nuclear. The next is electrical, 100 times weaker than the nuclear force. The next is the so-called weak force, a million times weaker. And the still next, the gravitational force, a billion, billion, billion times weaker still. All particles can be considered manifestations of one of these forces. The nuclear force seems to obey the SU-12 symmetry law. Its multiplets consist of 364 or more particles. The photon, the quantum of light, is the signature of the electri electromagnetic force, while the neutrino is the signature of the weak force. The electric and the nuclear forces seem to be fairly well understood. So is the gravitational force since the days of Newton and Einstein. The weak force is completely mysterious. Still more mysterious, however, is the fact of why all these forces are divided in this somewhat arbitrary manner. Why do they possess such different symmetry properties? Why do their strengths vary so very much? Physics can never rest till this final synthesis comes. The synthesis which, for example, can include not only the electric and the nuclear charges, but also the gravitational we have certainly not solved the whole of physics. In Oppenheimer's phrase, the future will be only more radical and not less, only more strange and not more familiar, and it will have its own new insights for the inquiring mind. The same thought was perhaps expressed some while ago by Fez Ahmed Fez. Kei bar uski khatir zare zare ka jigar chira magar ye chashme hairan jiski hairani nahin jati. 
if there is one hallmark of true science, if there is one perception that scientific knowledge heightens, it's the spirit of hairani, of tahayyur, of wonder. The deeper that one goes, the more profound that one sees, the more is one's sense of wonder increased. The theme of my series of lectures has been the search for unity in the understanding of nature. In the first lecture I said man has always believed in an eventual unity, an eventual simplicity, an eventual symmetry, which we shall discover in the scheme of things. If I have done anything, I hope to have shown you that allied with the wonder for God's creation, that allied with this wonder is the inescapable fact that all explanation we have ever found is based on symmetry concepts. Time and, time and again we have seen that whenever we are faced with two rival theories, both claiming to explain the same set of phenomena, one has always found that the theory more aesthetically satisfying, more beautiful, is also the correct one. The holy book has proclaimed this faith of the scientist in Surah Mulk. Matara fi khalqir rahmani min tafawut Farje al-basara haltara min futur Thou seest not in the creation of the all-merciful any imperfection. Return thy gaze, seest thou any fissure. Then return thy gaze again and again, and thy gaze comes back to thee, dazzled, aweary. <laughs> 